how the image got into the box, right? You would have to know whether or not it was a source that was connected to it. And again, I'm jumping ahead beyond to where these televisions exist in time uh, to talk about just comparing the different technologies. But let's say you have something that feeds the monitor directly, tape, DVR, DVD. You have cable television, you have satellite TV, internet, or broadcast. And of course, there are many more that we could talk about. But for purposes of this example, we'll settle on five. Well, the answer is you don't know if you could regulate that because you don't know how the picture got into the box, which is the way in which the different standards have come to apply under the First Amendment. You create a new First Amendment standard for a different medium based on its means of transmission. And so if it doesn't have a regulatory hook, then it's treated differently under the First Amendment. And so we've grown up with these traditions with different media of having an entirely different First Amendment apply to different media based on its technical characteristics. So, okay, eyes over here. Okay, uh, sorry. Um, the, um, we have seen in certain instances full First Amendment protection. So in the case of the direct feed to the, the monitor, you have no affirmative public interest obligations. You have no special negative um, restrictions on content beyond standard of sanity law, okay? And we're not getting close on this yet. Uh, cable television, as it finally has evolved, and we'll talk about that in a minute. Partial First Amendment protection based on some uh, local pub, uh, uh, programming requirements generally imposed through the uh, local franchise. Uh, you have some federal regulation, and we'll talk a little bit about that too, but fewer special restrictions on bad programming. Satellite television, much the same as cable, even though it uh, uses uh, frequencies in the same way that over-the-air broadcast does, for the most part, it's also a subscription medium. It has some set-aside requirements that Congress imposed a few years back, but again, fewer special restrictions on bad programming. And when I say bad, I'm usually talking about broadcast indecency. The Internet, full First Amendment protection. No public interest requirements, no special restrictions on bad programming. And then, of course, broadcast television. You have both public interest obligations, imposed through the license, and then you also have the uh, special restrictions on um, what the uh, FCC considers to be bad programming. From a first minute perspective, is the picture tube half full or half empty? Well, it kind of depends on your perspective, doesn't it? Um, this is uh, at best a guesstimate, but I think you can tell that just looking at these different media using the same in-home appliance to convey the information, um, and conveying the exact same information are then subject to differing levels of First Amendment protection. Now, that persisted and continues to persist in certain degrees uh, today, but as technology really began to change, uh, late 1970s, early 1980s, as cable was beginning to take off a uh, um, political scientist from MIT named Ithiel de Sola Poole wrote a prescient book called Technologies of Freedom that really began to analyze the way technology has been treated differently, both internationally, but in particular in the United States legal system. And interestingly, he, he had the insight to say that while the printing press uh, was the foundation of democracy, quite often the response to it was more to censor it than to uh, embrace it, as uh, we did in this system. Uh, he also talked about how different technologies uh, were not recognized as um, full members of the press at the outset, and they were regulated and put in a regulatory classification that corresponded to some of their early applications rather than how they would develop uh, and, and would be allowed to develop uh, and um, without assessing what their capabilities would be. So their regulation and their treatment constitutionally became calcified within those classifications. And uh, he pointed that change was coming because of the nature of technology, uh, because the different technologies were beginning to merge and the capabilities were beginning to expand, that we would come to a crossroads where we'd have to decide whether or not we were going to have regulation uh, versus freedom, and that basically it could go either way, although, as I mentioned later, Poole was a bit of an optimist. Around the same time, the FCC started moving toward uh, a certain degree of deregulation. It started really in the late uh, 1970s uh, under uh, Chairman Charlie Ferris, uh, 
continued in earnest in the 1980s under Chairman Mark Fowler and uh, during the Reagan administration. And during those years, you saw a number of key changes with the FCC. Uh, ascertainment, which had required licenses to licensees to go out and gather in a sort of a, a sort of a false process of um, gathering information, of, of um, collecting. <laughs> Henry, you could probably talk about this better than anyone in the room. Uh, of uh, uh, sort of getting people together in their community to find out what people believed and whether or not they were uh, actually serving their needs. It drove up the cost of, of license renewal without really doing much in terms of the programming. Um, it eliminated that process, eliminated a lot of the uh, requirements for filing for renewal, and it also eliminated most aspects of the Fairness Doctrine in the late 1980s. At the same time, uh, cable television was beginning to be recognized as a protected First Amendment medium in its own right. Starting in the late 1970s, the court started essentially flirting with the idea of uh, protecting cable television, saying that arguments against um, uh, the forced access requirements at least were not frivolous, and that uh, arguments on exclusive franchising um, may have some merit from a First Amendment perspective, although it wasn't ready at that point to uh, make a pronouncement, simply saying that cable television has some aspects that are like traditional press and some that aren't, and we're going to have to see down the road how we're going to deal with that. Later on in the um, 1990s and the end of the 1990s, uh, the court took the step and held that um, cable television was protected fully by the First Amendment, uh, at least as, with respect to the, the regulations that were at issue there. In the Turner Broadcasting System versus the FCC, it rejected the idea that cable television should be treated the way broadcasting is because of spectrum scarcity issues. And in U.S. versus Playboy Entertainment Group, specifically rejected uh, the, the theory that um, it should be treated like um, uh, broadcasting because it has the capability, unlike broadcasting, to block content on a household by household basis, okay? dealing specifically with the rationale that the Supreme Court had advocated in the early, had explained in the uh, Pacifica case. Couldn't resist adding that. At the same time, at least through the uh, mid to early 1990s, uh, the um, telephone companies were beginning to change the kind of information they wanted to provide and also were beginning to assert First Amendment rights. The bell system had been broken up in the, uh, uh, the 80s and that was still continuing the turmoil over that in the 90s. They were bucking against um, consent decree restrictions that kept them out of, the, the former bell companies out of electronic publishing. You also had cross ownership restrictions on providing cable service that the FCC imposed uh, and the, uh, the phone companies were beginning to go to court to challenge those regulations on First Amendment grounds. Uh, they were also beginning to win some First Amendment victories in some of the circuit courts. This, however, was cut short by passage of the Telecommunications Act of 1996. In this case, the uh, Congress uh, agreed that phone companies should provide competition to cable, and it uh, allowed phone companies to then get cable franchises, and it cut short the growing litigation. Those cases then never went to the Supreme Court, so we don't know what the court would have said about that. The other thing that uh, Congress did in, in the 1996 Act was to essentially declare an end to scarcity. As you can see here from the language of the Senate report, it talks about changes in technology since 1934, and because other technologies have come along, that the notion of scarcity really is different today, or at least different in the mid-1990s, than it was when the 1934 Act was adopted. The House report was even more emphatic. It basically said that scarcity is a thing of the past. And so as a result, uh, it made wide-scale wide changes in the Communications Act in one of the first uh, comprehensive rewrites of the Act uh, since 1934. However, and ironically, all aspects of the 1996 uh, Telecommunications Act that dealt with programming content were regulatory. Uh, the Communications Decency Act established indecency rules for the internet, internet, essentially treating the internet as if it were broadcasting and imposing the same indecency regulation on online communication as it had traditionally applied to radio and television. It also adopted Section 505, which restricted signal bleed on adult uh, cable networks. That was the, the uh, regulation that led to the Playboy case. It imposed V-chip requirements for broadcasters, and then it also imposed closed captioning and video description rules 
for broadcast and uh, cable networks. In many ways, this repeated the history of the Communications Act, Act having this dual nature. As I mentioned, uh, the Communications Act prohibited censorship, but at the same time, it established provisions that imposed censorship. Uh, you have a similar duality here, particularly with online speech, where in Section 230, uh, the Telecommunications Act said it's the express policy of the United States to preserve a competitive free market that exists because of services that are unfettered by federal or state regulation. And then 230 goes on to establish um, uh, essentially safe harbors for online providers of online services so that they won't be held liable for third-party content. Section 223, however, imposed the Communications Decency Act, which was the part that um, adopted internet uh, indecency regulations that were comparable to the ones that had previously existed and still exist for broadcasting. It didn't fare too well in the court. Um, Justice John Paul Stevens, who had written the uh, majority opinion for the court in Pacifica, upholding broadcast indecency regulations, uh, wrote for uh, the 7 to 2 uh, majority in Reno versus ACLU. And what is notable about his opinion, there are many notable things about it, but what is really notable is he expressly recognized this as a converged medium. He talked about the internet, uh, including not only traditional uh, print and news services, but also audio, video, and still images, as well as interactive real-time dialogue. Okay? Uh, this is unique in the history of the Supreme Court looking at media, because for the first time it's recognizing that it is a multimedia function. Um, it also distinguished the Internet from traditional regulation, saying that unlike the, uh, uh, the broadcast spectrum, uh, and talking about the conditions that prevailed when Congress first authorized regulation of the broadcast spectrum, not talking about today, um, it said that the Internet can hardly be considered a scarce, expressive commodity. The reason I had that aside about talking about conditions when the um, Communications Act was adopted is because you'll often hear people say, uh, actually people who are defending indecency regulations, that the Supreme Court in Reno actually reaffirmed uh, the FCC's uh, regulation on, under scarcity. I think it's important to point out that um, uh, those regulations were not really embraced by the court in Pacifica. I mean, I'm sorry, in, uh, in Reno versus ACLU. They were simply acknowledged as a historical fact. But here's the key thing about Reno versus ACLU. Our cases provide no basis for qualifying the level of First Amendment scrutiny that should be applied to this media. This is historic. This is the first time that the Supreme Court ever looked at a new communications medium and applied full First Amendment protection at the outset. It had always either not given it protection at all in the case of cinema and having it come along years later and, and then change that fact. It was not like the situation in cable where the court in, um, incrementally looked at the medium and said that it partakes some of the aspects of traditional print and then gradually over a few decades gave it full First Amendment protection. Here is a new medium that for the first time receives full First Amendment protection. It is unique in history. And along with that, a lot of the content regulations, essentially all of the content regulations, for the most part, in the 1996 Act, have not had a happy, uh, uh, a happy fate. Um, the indecency regulations, the Communications Decency Act, were struck down. The signal bleed regulations were struck down in Playboy. Uh, MPA versus FCC is a DC Circuit opinion that struck down the video description regulations. The only well, the um, uh, closed captioning regulations were never challenged, um, and. Um, the only one that really remains is the beat shift, which was never challenged and may be a pivotal factor in the, currently, uh, uh, the current cases that are being litigated about the constitutional validity of the FCC's indecency rules. Stay tuned on those cases. So, this is where the title comes from, the First Amendment and the End of History, like the fall of the Berlin Wall. Uh, is convergence going to mean the end of regulation of content of electronic media as we know it. Well, if you know anything about the expression, the end of history, it comes from a, well, first from an essay in Foreign Affairs and then um, uh, was expanded into this book by Francis Fukuyama that talked about the end of the Cold War and whether or not this was the end of history, whether or not the end of the 20th century meant that 
uh, as a matter of ideology, 